Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 1602. The topic is Q&A and the title is The Role of Lactate in Exercise. This is a nerdy one, <laughs> so make sure you're ready for it. Uh, I love these kind of ones. Uh, I, I don't know if like everyone is interested about these kind of like nuanced things, but they're super fun to know. So what this actually came up from was in our gym, we have a board in which the members can write on like, um, like index cards, any questions they have. Now, if you ever have a question for the podcast, you can always email me, brutalironjim at gmail.com. You can submit a topic request on our website, www.brutalironjim.com. Just any way you want to reach out to us. <laughs> you know, if you can, if you can send me a message anywhere, uh, then you can submit any question you want. And I'll make you a podcast, but we make it a little bit easier for our members. And then also it's nice to have on the board because then other members can see questions people have asked and then what podcast was related to that. And then it's kind of a, you know, nice, awesome, uh, educational resource for everybody. So the question that one of the members put on recently was what role does lactate play in fuel systems? Uh, so I just kind of wanted to go through the process in which, lactate is formed and then what does it do for us and then how can we actually apply some of this information so when you eat carbohydrates or whenever you're exercising and your body needs more energy it'll it'll start to break down uh, carbohydrates that are stored within your muscles the carbohydrates that are stored within your muscles are called glycogen and there's gonna be some fancy words in this but I'll try my best to make everything kind of simple but I also like you to hear the fancy words, that way you know what they are. <laughs> so glycogen is just when we have carbohydrates that we ate before, our body didn't need them at that time. So it's like, well, you know, let me hold on to this in case I need energy in my muscles for something else later in the day. So it'll take carbohydrates, it pairs it with sodium and water, and it puts it in our muscles. And that's just, so that way our body, our muscles have carbohydrates ready to go. So it's like gas, like a gas tank for a car. The uh, glycogen is like gas in the gas tank for your muscles. So whether we're eating carbohydrates or whether the body's breaking down carbohydrates that have been eaten before, uh, it'll break carbohydrates down into what's called glucose, uh, which is essentially anything you eat, whether it's sugary or a very slow digesting complex carbohydrate, it all breaks down eventually into glucose. Then, uh, glucose uh, is then broken down into two parts called pyruvate. So again, really weird words, but I want you to hear the words so that way they make sense to you. So when you eat carbohydrates, they break down into molecules of glucose. And then we break molecules of glucose down into pyruvate. That process when you're breaking apart a glucose is called glycolysis. So when a glucose, so again, carbohydrates turn into glucose, glucose turns into pyruvate. Now during that process of glucose turning into pyruvate, we produce something called, a little bit of something called ATP. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But that is kind of the base molecule of energy. That's, that's what we want to get to. You know, that's the, the final thing that our body can really use and it produces energy, allows us to, you know, move our muscles, do all the things. So ATP is eventually where we want to get to. So when I eat carbohydrates and I say I'm eating carbohydrates for energy, the, the energy term, like how you actually get energy is ATP. So carbohydrates have to go to glucose, glucose goes to pyruvate, and then that part of that process creates some of that ATP. Now there's a lot more ATP later on. I'll come back to that. But some of that ATP is produced at that moment. But that, that, that energy can be used some, but it's a very small amount. The APT that's produced from glycolysis, which is glucose to pyruvate, uh, it can be used for energy. But then we also have those pyruvate molecules like sitting there and ready to go. So our body then takes that pyruvate, 
and combines it with oxygen when there's enough oxygen. Um, and it goes through this multi-step process called the Krebs cycle. And I'm, I won't go too much further into that because that's a little bit much. <laughs> this is already too much. But um, So when you take pyruvate, you, you combine it with oxygen, goes through these steps, and it leads to a bunch, a bunch, 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 bunch of ATP. That's, that's really what we want. That, that's going to be like 10 to 20 times more than just that little bit of ATP that was created from the glucose being broken down into pyruvate. When the pyruvate is broken down with oxygen, that creates the bulk, the major bulk of our energy, that ATP. So again, it's, it's like recap, <laughs> is carbs, whether we eat them or they're broken down from being stored, uh, they turn into glucose. Glucose breaks down into some ATP and pyruvate, and then pyruvate with oxygen creates a bunch of ATP, and that's really what we want. Now, unfortunately, though, there's like a physiological kind of limit to how much pyruvate can be broken down with how much oxygen. So there's actually a limit to that, and I'll, again, I'll kind of come back in a second, but it's good for us to kind of be aware that at, at some point that system doesn't work. <laughs> Meaning that it only works if there's oxygen available. So what do we do when we don't have oxygen? Or when we've maxed out and used as much oxygen as we're able to be continuing to come in. So I can only breathe so much, right? If you try to breathe in as much, ox much oxygen as you can, you can only breathe in so many breaths per unit of time. There's not an infinite amount of breathing that you can do. <laughs> You'll probably pass out. So eventually there's a limit to the amount of oxygen you can bring in. Therefore, there's the limit to the amount of ATP that can be created via oxygen, like with the use of oxygen, through that thing called Krebs cycle. So what do we do when our oxygen has been maxed out? Well, when, there, when that happens, there's going to be extra pyruvate sitting around. So our body broke the carbohydrates into glucose, it broke the glucose into pyruvate. Some of the pyruvate got broken down with oxygen to make ATP, but then there isn't enough oxygen sitting around, so some of the pyruvate's just sitting there. Well, what happens is the pyruvate connects to hydrogen molecules. And when you have a pyruvate plus a hydrogen, that's what's what creates lactate. So when you think of lactic acid, I'll come back in a second here, lactate is the thing you're thinking of. So people unfortunately like use the name um, synonymously, but they're, they're a little different there. So pyruvate plus oxygen is lactate. Lactate is actually awesome for us. Lactate is not acidic. Lactate is actually an acidic buffer. So what happens is when the hydrogen is just free in your system, and I'll talk about where that comes from in a second, but when hydrogen is free in your system, that's acidic. That creates burning and that creates pain in muscle movements, like why we feel so miserable that we have to stop and exercise from burning horrible pain. That's from the buildup of hydrogen. So when you have extra pyruvate available and it binds with some of those hydrogens, it creates lactate. So lactate actually brings down the amount of free hydrogen in your blood, and it actually reduces the acidic environment, the burning sensation that you have. So lactate actually reduces the burning sensation you have in muscles. So lactate is good. Lactate all also creates what, like, consider it, basically it, it makes like a holding phase for the pyruvate. So you can basically have the pyruvate, it binds to the hydrogen, and then it, it waits until there's enough oxygen to then be able to be used. So it kind of gives it a holding phase. So we don't just lose the pyruvate. We can, we can get, basically it binds with the hydrogen. It, it sits around and waits now until we get enough oxygen to where it can be used. It has to wait to take its turn, essentially. Then also, in that phase of pyruvate and hydrogen, it can be transported in the bloodstream to the muscles that need it most. So if my legs are dying because I'm doing some crazy, horrible exercise, you know, lower body exercise, and my body's like, holy crap, like the leg muscles are maxed out. Well, it can start to break down glycogen from other muscles. It can take glycogen from, say, the shoulders and break it to pyruvate 
uh, basically, it takes the high, like glycogen, it, it separates out the glucose, the sodium, and the water. It takes the glucose, breaks that into pyruvate, combines that with the hydrogen atoms available within the shoulder muscles, transports that via the blood down to the legs, and now all of a sudden we have extra pyruvate in the legs. And then as we breathe in more oxygen, the body can then use that pyruvate to create more ATP to give us more energy and to buffer more acidic uh, hydrogen ions. So... Lactate is actually awesome. It buffers acid, and it's a holding phase for more energy when we need it. So it'll eventually allow us to create more and more and more energy. Now, a great question you might want to have at this point is where did the hydrogen come from? So you talk about this hydrogen being there for when the pyruvate would pair with it to make lactate. Well, we well, well, just explained where the pyruvate comes from, but where did the hydrogen come from? Hydrogen is acidic, so people think lactate, is, like when combined with hydrogen, is acidic, say like lac lactic acid. But that's actually a buffer, like we said, is the hydrogen pairing with the the, la um, the pyruvate to make lactate actually reduces the amount of hydrogen that's in the bloodstream, so it actually is a buffer for acid. So it actually makes you less miserable. <laughs> so the hydrogen comes from the breakdown of that ATP. So I said that ATP is like the baseline molecule of energy, the, 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 the end goal of all of this metabolism. The end goal is to get to ATP. When, uh, like ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So it's adenosine plus three phosphates. When any ATP is used, it's broken down into ADP, and there's this extra phosphate available, and that that comes from the use of uh, H2O. We end up with an extra H, and that's where the hydrogen comes from. So when ATP is used, when we get the energy kind of we needed from it, it leaves an, a hydrogen atom behind. So that's what produces the acidic environment is just the simple use of ATP. So as we use more and more energy, uh, it produces more and more hydrogen. A way of thinking of this is as you use a gasoline car, you produce waste into the environment, right? Uh, to some degree, and I know there's regulations and blah, 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 blah. But if you burn gasoline to fuel your car, there's an exhaust pipe and there's some form of waste, so when you use ATP to fuel your muscles, the waste is the hydrogen. So that can be buffered by being paired with excess uh, pyruvate. But there's eventually a limit to how much pyruvate is available. So there's initially a limit to how much pyruvate can be used because how much oxygen we can get in and how intense our training is. Can we even breathe enough by the time that it's all builds up? And then the extra pyruvate that's around can pair with some of the extra hydrogens. But eventually there's just more hydrogens being left over than there is pyruvate to pair with it to buffer it. So when the initial use of pyruvate and oxygen is maxed out, that Krebs cycle is maxed out, the body then uses the extra pyruvate, pairs with lactate. That creates that like holding phase. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the hydrogen, the extra pyruvate pairs with hydrogen, that creates lactate, yes. So that then creates a buffer, but there's still excessive, excessive amounts of hydrogen that the body just cannot correct, cannot adjust for. The more intense we are in, in our training, the more anaerobic, like non-oxygen-based movements we do, there's just a faster buildup of hydrogen. The faster that builds up, the more pain you perceive and the more miserable you feel, the way more, like you're just out of breath, everything hurts like crazy, and you are you either have to quit because it hurts, or you quit because your muscles just can't perform anymore. So the body will make as much lactate as it possibly can to try to buffer as much of the hydrogen as it can. And then there's still leftover hydrogen, depending on the uh, level of intensity that you have. So this extreme buildup of lactate and then whenever it just can't do it anymore and you get this shoot up of like uh, free hydrogen that's called a lactate threshold so people would would feel that that's lactic acid like burning 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 but the lactate is actually helping you 
So the acidic part is the hydrogen. The lactate is actually the buffer. It's just eventually we can't buffer all the hydrogens that are available. So we get that burning sensation. Now that is cleared within minutes. Within minutes of stopping activity and breathing, the body clears all that ox like all the hydrogen and all the lactate. So the idea of like lactic acid being like in your muscles, uh, you know, for hours or days, that's not true. It clears it within minutes. So you're sore, typically like just from simple the breakdown, the damage of the muscle tissue itself. So when you feel sore from training, it's not that there was a buildup of lactic acid. Remember, lactate plus hydrogen is actually good for us. So when you feel sore uh, after workouts, that's a, a kind of a, a different process. Now, we have podcast 1214 as a mindset podcast titled, is soreness, an, a good, uh, is soreness an Indicator of a Good Workout? And that's something funny if you want to listen to that and kind of learn more about that. But... You don't have to be sore after workouts for it to be a good workout. And if you don't do muscle damaging activity, you're not going to typically be sore and therefore you'll be fearful that it wasn't a good workout. So soreness is not related to lactic acid and soreness is not a direct indicator of whether it's a good workout or not. Okay, we made it through all that. <laughs> I hope that that was a good job as much as like verbally can be done. I wish there was, you know, I wish I could show you some images, but that is basically the process in which how lactate is, is created in the body and then what role lactate actually serves within the body. The good thing we want to talk about now is what can I do with this? Like everything you just said, how's, how is that useful to me? There's a couple takeaways and I'm going to do two that I, I consider all the time, these are things that everyone should think of, is number one, having carbohydrates available at the time of training is very, very good for performance and the production of the stimulus of change that you want from the workout. So fasted workouts where you haven't eaten anything beforehand or keto-only fueled workouts where you're eating no carbohydrates at all are horrible, horrible environments. If you want to maximize performance and minimize the sensation of pain while training. Can you train fasted? Yes. Can you train being fueled only by ketones? Absolute. Are they optimal for, for performance? No. Are they optimal for long-term Progress, no. Because if you underperform in your workouts, you're going to be understimulated by your workouts and you're going to get under adaptation. So having carbohydrates around your workouts, like before your workouts, leading into the workouts, is the best environment for maximal performance and minimal pain while working out, like that burning sensation pain. So carbohydrates are awesome. They help you. They're good things. Even if your goal is fat loss, you want to fuel your workouts with carbohydrates. Again, can you train fasted? Yes. Can you train uh, keto, like based on, like with ketones? Yes. But is it best for performance? No. Is it best for long-term progress? No. Okay. The other takeaway is properly control your breathing and your intensity rate of training to match your desired length of performance. I'll explain that. <laughs> is if your lack of ability to breathe starts to reduce your performance, but yet you want to continue to perform, meaning you're not actually trying to make the body fail, you really want to continue to perform, maybe you have a goal outcome, maybe you're in a competition, then you have to slow down what you're doing. You have to either take in more oxygen or Inc decrease the intensity of what you're doing. But if you want to push your body's ability to process through that phase, then you want to continue to go even if your performance drops. So what this means is, are you in a training session or are you performing? Is your goal performance outcome or performance investment? These are very important things to consider. So the takeaway from this is follow a proper diet. 
make sure you have the right amount of foods at the right times. And carbohydrates are great for you. They're not bad for you. Don't worry about it. You just want to have the right amount at the right time. If you want help with that, we have our one-on-one -on -one coaching service uh, where I do both your training and nutrition or just your nutrition. So if you have a great training program, the training and nutrition is $200 a month, no contracts. I write everything personalized to you. You can ask me any questions you want. We talk every single week. Uh, then we also have our one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is $100 a month just for nutrition. And that I write everything specific for you, uh, like the specific macros, the right amount of like the right types of foods. We talk about the timing of everything based on your schedule, when you work out, and you get unlimited Q&A. I talk to you every single week. So great services right there. The second takeaway, so the first one was follow a proper diet. The second takeaway is follow a proper program that matches your goals. Make sure that your program is focused on either performance investment, if that's the phase of your training you should be in, or is it focused on performance outcome? Too often people train for maximal outcome when they should be training for maximal investment. Am I training today to get stronger in the future or just to show what strength I have today? Am I training today to max out the rep ranges of each exercise or am I training to die within the rep ranges listed so I have the maximum amount of fat loss, muscle shape, and muscle building in the future? You have to have a proper program that's written for whether you should be doing performance outcome or performance investment. If you don't do that properly, you're not going to get the best results long term. If you want help with that, <laughs> we have our one-on-one -on -one coaching service. Again, where I do training and nutrition. Again, that's $200 a month, no contracts. But we also have our live monthly programming, which is only $50 a month. You still get unlimited Q&A. You can ask anything you want, and I'll answer it uh, every single week. And then you can still ask me a bunch of nutrition stuff. But that one, what that program is, the live monthly programming, is you pick between five, like among five topics of programs. There's power building, which is like, you can do power lifting and not gain muscle mass, or you can do power lifting plus gaining muscle tissue. So you can be power lifting and bodybuilding combined or power lifting alone. So that's power building. We also have a female shape development. We have pure bodybuilding, functional uh, longevity, and functional athleticism. So we have those topics. You get a brand new program every four weeks. All exercises have a ex uh, video tutorial. There are six workouts uh, per week. So you can perform them as many as you want. They're written in the order you should do them in. So if you can only get the first three in, great. If you can get the first four in, great. Uh, but if you can get all six, congratulations. Good for you. <laughs> but it's it's brand new workouts every four weeks. You get unlimited Q&A. You can ask me anything you want on a Google Doc, and I'll answer it for you. And that includes nutrition. So you get brand new workouts every single month, every four weeks, and you get unlimited education, and it's only $50 a month and there's no contract. So that's a lot of really cool stuff. A lot of cool opportunities for personalized programming, both nutrition and training, and tons of free education. Okay, so if you love this kind of stuff, if you like these nerdy, nuancy things, uh, you know, hopefully this was very helpful. I encourage you then to send me more questions anytime you want. I love doing these kind of things. Uh, it's fun to get into the details every now and then. And then if you need any help with nutrition, training, anything at all, uh, just email me. My email is brutalironjim at gmail.com. Let me know what you're struggling with and I'll help you. Okay? Awesome. Well, if you have any questions, feedback, suggestions, anything you want to know, let me know at my email, brutalironjim at gmail.com. If you like our podcast, please share it. The more people we share it with, the more people can help. When you share it, encourage people to send in questions and tell them that this is a free service. They can ask anything and we'll make them a podcast. And then thank you to those who donate to support the podcast. That way this can be a free service. If you want to donate, you can do so on our website. There's a high hosting cost every single year. I give an hour to this thing every day. So I really, truly appreciate the donations. They help go towards covering some of that cost right now, which I really appreciate. Just reduces some of the burden for me. So I appreciate it very, very much. And then if you like the information we share in our podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. I post on Instagram every day, YouTube a lot. So find us and follow us under the name Brutal Iron Gym. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.